Good afternoon, I'm Juliane Kempfield. I'm the director of Deutsches Haus at NYU. Welcome to Kehlmann in Control. Open Austria Art and Tech Lab and Deutsches Haus at NYU are thrilled to present this conversation between renowned author Daniel Kehlmann and philosopher and AI researcher Brian McKenn, who will discuss collaborating on AI storytelling, an innovative project in which they jointly explored and experimented with the process of creating new stories by working with an algorithm named Control. Daniel Kielmann reflected on this creative collaboration between art and technology and on the challenges of human and artificial creativity in his widely acclaimed new essay, Mein Algorithmus und Ich, My Algorithm and Me, from which during our event, he will read in the essay's congenial translation by Russ Benjamin. And Russ Benjamin, as a sort of surprise guest, has uh, joined us and will be uh, joining their discussion and also the Q&A. Thank you, Russ. The event will be moderated by Clara Blume, head of Open Austria's Art and Tech Lab, and will include a live demonstration of Kielmann's collaboration with Control, providing insight um, into which formats proved more successful than others. Um, before we start, and before I actually hand things over to Martin Rauchbauer, let me thank a few individuals and institutions for making this collaboration and this event happen. Uh, of course, most of, our, most of all, Daniel Kehlmann, Brian McKenn, Clara Blume, and Ross Benjamin, Thank you so much for being here today and uh, for shedding light into this fascinating topic. Thank you also, Clara and Martin Rauchbauer and Kylie Miebus from Open Austria for being wonderful partners in crime, putting this event together and for originally, of course, inviting Daniel over to Silicon Valley and to getting this whole co collaboration with Brian started. I also would like to thank Klett Kotta, the German publisher who published Daniel Kielmann's uh, Zukunftsrede. His essay uh, was first uh, published in, not published, but he first read his essay as a Stuttgarter Zukunftsrede. And I'm not quite sure how to translate Zukunftsrede, perhaps speech on the future, but maybe Ross can elaborate on a better translation. Last but not least, my colleagues, I would like to thank Zara, Adriana, and Linda for working behind the scenes and making this possible. Zara, thank you also so much for running the technology. Really couldn't do it without you. And last, 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 thank you, um, dear attendees, for joining us. And uh, please remember, we have more events coming up next week. We have a conversation uh, with Alexander Ozang and Jana Hensel about Alexander Ozang's new book. And in May, we will present an um, event, a conversation with uh, Academy Award winning director Carolina Link about when Hitler stole Pink Rabbit. So now it is my great, great pleasure uh, to hand things over to Martin Rauchbauer, the director of Open Austria. Martin, it's your turn and I'm so delighted we had a chance to work together. We are old colleagues, so to speak, and it's, it's always a great treat and uh, pleasure to work with you on pretty much anything I can imagine. So please, it's your floor, Martin, bye-bye. Well, thank you so much, Juliane, and uh, good morning from San Francisco from the Open Austria Arts and Tech Lab. For me personally, it's really great to be back at the wonderful Deutsches Haus at NYU, even if only virtually. As Juliane already mentioned, I was uh, serving there as her predecessor uh, in the house from 2011 and 2014. And on behalf of Open Austria, which is the institution I serve at today, I feel very honored to introduce the three panelists for today's event whom I all admire, but also because all three of them are dear friends. And before I do that, here's a bit of back, uh, background to today's event. AI storytelling is a signature project of the Open Austria Arts and Tech Lab, which was only formed in 2020 and is headed by cultural diplomat and artist and my dear colleague, Clara Blume, whom you will be hearing in a moment. On Valentine's Day of last year, the lab invited Daniel Kielmann to Palo Alto, the very heart of Silicon Valley, to meet Brian McCann and his natural language processing algorithm control. 
We're going to hear a lot about this remarkable encounter today and of its outcome, but I only want to mention that the ensuing collaboration between Daniel Bryan and Control was recognized at the recent South by Southwest Festival in March, where Daniel and Bryan were awarded with the EVE Award, a newly founded prize by the European Network, the grid, specifically honoring collaborative artworks that push the envelope of human and artificial creativity. But let me say a bit more about Clara, Daniel, and Brian. So Daniel Kehlmann does not need much introduction, being one of the most eminent authors of our time. Daniel is a novelist, playwright, and occasional screenwriter of both German and Austrian origin and has lived extensively in his three home cities, Vienna, New York, and Berlin, where he's currently residing. In the United States, he became very well known with his novel Die Vermessung der Welt, or in English, Measuring the World, which was translated into more than 40 languages and established his fame as a best-selling author around the world. Kielmann's highly praised novel Till in 2017 was published in the US in February of last year and is currently being adapted into a TV series for Netflix. The novel was shortlisted for the 2020 International Booker Prize. In Germany, Daniel has won the prestigious Kandit Prize, the Hölderlin Prize, the Kleist Prize, the Weltliteratur Prize, and the Thomas Mann Prize. Now to Brian McCann, who is a technologist, but also a philosopher of language who resides here in the Bay Area. Brian is currently co-founder and CTO of U.com, building the new search experience. Previously, he was an AI lead research scientist at Salesforce in Palo Alto, where he worked on deep learning and its applications to natural language processing and natural language understanding. His re research focused on transferring knowledge between AI systems, creating artificial intelligence that is more general and unified in the way that it approaches natural language tasks and AI that can generate sequences of symbols, both with words in English, but also with amino acids, as in proteins, based on input specifications from a, from a user. He obtained uh, a, um, a, 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 an MS and a, and a BS in computer science focused on artificial intelligence, as well as a degree in philosophy from Stanford University. And now to my dear colleague, Clara Blume, who will kick off the discussion in just a few moments. Clara works as a European cultural diplomat and artist in Silicon Valley, heading the Open Austria Arts and Tech Lab to explore the interplay of human and artificial creativity. Set out as a laboratory for open and interdisciplinary collaboration, Clara curates and commissions art projects that question what it means to be human in the age of artificial intelligence. She's the co-founder and president of the Arts, Tech and Policy Network, The Grid, supported with funding by the EU and Salesforce. Prior to a new role in cultural diplomacy, she worked as a professional musician, songwriter, and internationally touring recording artist. Clara studied music composition and fine arts at Academia de Bellas Artes in Madrid, and she holds an MA in comparative literature and a PhD in cultural studies and history from the University of Vienna. But before I hand over to Clara, I want to also introduce to you a special person and friend who happens to be one of the world's finest translators from German into English, Ross Benjamin, who joins us from New York in New York. It was his translation of Daniel Kehmann's novel, Till, that was shortlisted for the 2020 International Booker Prize. It is also translated, Daniel, You Should Have Left. Ross has translated works by German classics Friedrich Hölderlin, Hyperion, Joseph Roth, and Franz Kafka, numerous as well as numerous contemporary German language authors into English. His translation of Franz Kafka's Complete Diaries will be published by Schocken Books in 2022. He's won numerous awards, among them the Helen and Kurt Wolf Translators Prize for his translation of Michael Maas Speak, Nabokov, uh, 2012 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fel Fellowship, and a 2015 Guggenheim Fellowship. Ross is here today because he translated Daniel's essay, My Algorithm and Me, which is at the center of today's event. Very much looking forward now to the discussion and hand it over to you, Clara. Well, thank you so much, Martin. Um, how exciting to see that our project is um, taking off and that we have the chance to continue this conversation. Before I get started and before we jump into our discussion with Daniel and Brian, I would like to welcome Daniel to set the stage for our adjacent conversation on AI and the future of literature by reading a short passage 
from his most recent literary publication, My Algorithm and Me, in a wonderful translation of Ross Benjamin. Daniel, the stage is all yours. Good evening, uh, or good afternoon in, in New York. Um, for me in Berlin, it's early evening. Um, I'm going to read just the beginning, first few pages of my essay. On February 14, 2020, I flew from New York to San Francisco, not suspecting that it was a dangerous thing to do. By then the virus was all over the news, but it was not quite real to us yet. I stood in a long line at New York airport, later at a departure gate full of people, for half an hour in the so-called passenger boarding bridge, and then I sat in a plane filled to capacity. The virus must have been on board from a statistical point of view, but I got lucky, remained uninfected and returned to New York in good health. My destination was Palo Alto in the legendary Silicon Valley. I'd been invited by an Austrian institution called Open Austria. And the purpose of my trip was an experiment. A cloud computing company had developed a powerful algorithm for natural language. Now Open Austria had come up with the idea of having a writer collaborate with the artificial intelligence. Can an algorithm make up stories? Can it be used as a tool for, literature work, for literary work, yielding something that could be published, not as a curiosity, but as true literature? Without having to think about it for even a second, I accepted. How often do you get the chance to take a trip into the future? If technology was on the verge of rendering my profession superfluous, at least I would be the first to know it. Frazzled by the flight, I arrived in San Francisco. Even now, I couldn't remember what movie I'd just watched. My eyes were sore and I had a headache. Martin and Clara from Open Austria were waiting for me. They were cheerful, ironic and funny in a way only Austrians can be when they're picking up another Austrian from the airport of a city far away from Austria. Martin is an experienced diplomat I knew well from his time in New York. Clara is a magnificent singer who, alongside her musical career, works as a curator and organizer. The two of them are a fantastic team full of unconventional ideas which they actually translate into action. On the drive into the city, we were caught in a traffic jam for a long time before we finally arrived at Martin's house where I was spending the night. Martin had invited several experts to dinner to give me a crash course on the subject of artificial intelligence. I was not quite a blank slate, having read some books, but as so often in life, it's another thing altogether to speak with the real practitioners, the people for whom the matters you've dealt with on an abstract level are a concrete part of their everyday life. Predictive algorithms seem to understand things, but in actuality they make predictions. That is not a trivial detail. You can solve a problem by insight or by a probabilistic assessment of future events. If, for example, you ask someone the shortest way home, this person could just describe to you the route to be taken. Alternatively, however, the person could predict what route someone with sound knowledge of the area would take. In both cases, the resulting route is the same, but these are still two different solving processes. If I give you a text to translate, you could read it, understand it and transpose it into a different language, or having statistically sifted through a huge volume of data, you could simply predict what translation someone who, unlike yourself, had a command of the language would offer you. The data on the basis of which you'd be making this prediction are, of course, millions and millions of translations of other texts by other people. That is, without the work of human translators who actually understand the language, it would not be possible. But the predictive algorithm making use of this human work via statistical, uh, via statistical analysis, an, anal, anal, analysis, anal, analysis, sorry, analysis, does not itself need to understand the language. It has neither dictionaries nor grammar rules on hand and it has no idea what its proposed result means. Indeed, it wouldn't even know what that's supposed to be, meaning or idea. 
I was a little slow to comprehend, but the experts were patient. Only gradually did it dawn on me that I had still that I had still been imagining artificial intelligence about which I'd read so much, like the Android C3PO or the narcissistic supercomputer Hell, as a human being encased in metal, in a person in costume. I had still pictured something like the artificial woman in Fritz Lang's Metropolis, a switch is thrown, electricity flows, light pulses, suddenly she opens her eyes and as of that moment she is more or less one of us. Or that charming movie from my childhood, Short Circuit, a little robot is struck by lightning, opens his eyes and from then on he's a sweet, naive, quickly learning little fellow. A very similar character later appeared in the Pixar animation film WALL-E. When you imagine all these movie computers from within, so to speak, they are entirely normal people with thoughts and feelings in a metal shell. They are all bearers of consciousness. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Daniel. I think that really sets the stage um, for us to jump in into this discussion. And um, just to you, dear audience, this is a continuation of a conversation that we had a couple of weeks back while awarding Daniel and Brian the first ever EVO Award during South by Southwest. If you have trouble following some of the thoughts of today's discussion, I welcome you to check out our previous event. My dear colleague Kylie will post the link in the chat function. And you can also ask questions during the Q&A session, which will be lengthy, so no worries. Um, there's, not, there's no stupid question when it comes to AI. Um, so since we're fortunate to welcome Ross Benjamin to the stage, I would like to kick off today's this, um, conversation with a bit of an unconventional opening by talking about literary translation. However, I believe that this is actually a really interesting segue in the, into this broader discussion that we wanna open up on authorship, language, as well as the production and translation of meaning. So Ross, one of the biggest challenges in literary translation is to balance remaining true and faithful to the original work while at the same time creating an entirely new and unique piece of literature that evokes the same responses as the original piece. And Honestly, I think this tension must be incredibly hard to navigate and I'm personally in awe of your talent since I've read both the original and the translation of Daniel's essay. My question to you would be, how do you manage to preserve Daniel's voice, a, um, the meaning that he's trying to convey by a language? How do you preserve the original intent of the author? Yeah, there's a lot in there. But, uh, am I echoing to anybody else? I'm echoing to myself. It's okay. Um, so, um, um, well, I think it does help to, the way I think of it helps, sort of the framework through which I think of it, which is not um, where there's a, a real dichotomy between fidelity and making it my own. But instead, I, I tend to think of myself as an active agent in the continuation of the work and in the, in the afterlife of the work. And, and in that way, I think of my fidelity as inevitably a process of making it my own, um, um, not by taking undue liberties, but by finding what I think is the most um, um, striking and essential aspects of the original that I can bring out in, in the um, translation. And um, um, I find it very useful to think about um, how the how the author is making meaning in terms of um, I don't just think about the meaning as something to extract from from the words of the author and then put into words in English as if to like put it in my own words um, I think of the meaning the author is making as bound up with the the way they're making that meaning and the the um, um, types of sentences they're writing the rhythms and the the um, uh, the tone, the humor, the, the, the musicality. Uh, so everything that the language is doing in the original, um, the how of it as much as the what. And I'm trying to um, reproduce that, that, that technique or that way of, of making meaning um, 
which of course is inevitably going to be inflected by my own instincts and idioms and and personal um, uh, even even preferences. Um, and in that way, yeah, it's sort of uh, it is full of of, of challenges, um, incredible challenges, sometimes uh, insurmountable challenges that I just will always fall short of. But um, I'm not usually that haunted by um, uh, that tension between between fidelity and making it my own. I'm more um, haunted by all of the individual uh, choices and, and and foreclosed options and and so on. Interesting. That is certainly also due to the fact that you're well uh, well versed in in your craft at this point. Um, but you were mentioning all these little details and nuances that actually compose a style, right? The music, the sounds, the tone, the influxes, the idioms, everything that is that composes Daniel's voice. So Daniel, let's segue into um, a very broad question. How do you produce meaning as a writer? Um, it's a good question. And it's a good question I don't really have a great answer to. I mean, like everyone can write and everyone produces meaning when you write something down. You write something down, you write a note to yourself or you write an email to somebody. That's also meaning. So uh, the, the, there's not that much difference, actually, when I write an email or when I write an essay. Both is actually for some to, for someone to understand something factual or some thoughts of mine. It is a little bit different when I write fiction because fiction is storytelling and um, in storytelling uh, I feel it's a different process. Um, even though it's a process that's not easy to describe but it's really something about um, producing an entity that in itself is fulfilling and uh, and and uh, aesthetically satisfying to the reader. Um, that's a different kind of meaning than 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 writing an an, an essay. And again, um, an essay like I, I wrote here, um, I have to remind myself when I when I write it that I have to deal I have to treat it the same way as if it would be an email to a friend of mine. Um, where I'm trying to give an idea of an experience I had and some thoughts I have, um, but the essay doesn't need to be uh, an, as, an, as an aesthetically pleasing entity. It just needs to make people understand what I'm trying to tell them, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And that's why clearly there's, um algorithms already being used to redact uh, press releases and, and write their own press releases, because that is a very different task than a creative task of storytelling and narrative consistency. Therefore, Brian, how does control create meaning? Yeah, great question. Um, does control create meaning? Um, yeah, I, this, this is a great question. I'm glad that, that uh, I've had the chance to talk with some of you about it in the past. And I feel like our our thoughts on it keep um, kind of growing and, and changing over time as well. Um, maybe as a little little bit of a background story, one of the first projects that I worked on, the, the first paper I published in AI, was uh, had to do with machine translation. Um, and uh, since Ross is here, I just uh, I want to bring up translation again. Um, and and I had this interesting experience where. I was working on a machine translation model, which was translating from English to German and German to English. Um, and what I, what the goal of the project was, was to say, uh, could we take the part of the algorithm that, that, uh, that um, translates, there's, there's kind of two stages. There's a, there's a stage in the, in the algorithm, which was a neural network that takes the English and tries to understand it. And then there's like a pretty clear demarcation where you can say, okay, at this point, we're going to start running the German translation part where it goes into German. And so by training it on millions of examples, the way Daniel described, um, we, we, trained, we trained the system, but then the idea was, let's just take the English part 
that translates all the way to where there's some numbers somewhere and we don't understand it anymore, but right before the German system starts. Um, and we're going to go take that and like use it for other things like English sentiment classification, uh, question answering, and just see if by learning how to translate in this AI way, all through statistics, right? Um, would it be better or would it appear to understand English more uh, on these other tasks? We, we use like the word task. So machine translation is a task, question answering, summarization. And, and, and it did, it was better um, for people who may have uh, some insight into like the, the NLP literature right now. Um, there, there was a Sesame Street trend of naming algorithms like Elmo and Bert um, and these things called contextualized word vectors came from came from this project and this idea of taking parts of a model that um, look at words in their context. We started with machine translation actually, uh, and and then we moved towards language modeling, which is more like control. Okay, so so why did I tell that story? In in that project, there was there was a day where I was in the office. And I had gone in as uh, someone who had kind of studied philosophy of language in college. And I was, I was looking for meaning. I was looking for questions of meaning um, and looking for answers in some sense. That's what this was all about for me. And as soon as in some sense I had had this system and built it and knew every line of code that it would take to do this, I felt like whatever this was that I had made, the meaning wasn't there. Now, this is just a, an anecdote to kind of give some of the intuition that I've been building over the years of, of like the meaning kind of disappears once it's a, once it feels like a machine and feels um, like we, we could just reconstruct it. it. It felt more like an extension of our meaning and our process rather than some mystical uh, personified system that's making meaning in and of itself. So. So yeah, I, I don't, maybe that's a complicated answer. It doesn't really answer it, but. Uh, it's a perfect yeah. answer. And it, it perfectly sets the stage for the conversation that we'll have in a short while. But um, I'd like to start the narrative arc uh, from a different perspective, um, from a different point before we dive into exactly that question that you just raised, raised, which is extremely essential for the conversation we're having, right? So that you, you peek behind the curtain and you couldn't find meaning. And um, this disconnect that we seem that we want to project meaning into a machine, but are always held back by the fact that we um, are actually dealing with a machine and not a human being. We'll talk about this in a moment, but there was another thing striking in what you said, which is you tried to understand English, right? This comprehension of the language, this basically deciphering or trying to break this riddle up, um, of what produces language and why. At this stage, I'd like to thank Russ Benjamin for kicking off this conversation and say goodbye. So thank you so much for joining. And um, we'll continue the conversation with Daniel and Brian and get into the nitty gritty of predict predictive algorithms. So first, because this is a pressing question on everyone's mind, I wanna raise that point. One of the most astonishing revelations that I took away from our experiment was the fact that everyone involved uh, really started to question the nature of the creative process. As we heard earlier, how meaning is produced, how it is conveyed, how, is, how it is quite literally translated. And even further than that, we're all facing the question of what really makes us human, which automatically leads to the question of are machines really that different? And if so, how? In essence, at this point, I wanna talk about control and the very human fear of losing it. So um, Daniel, while working with control, did you feel in control at all times? Um, yeah, I mean the the I the sort I did. Um, uh, I was actually yeah I, I I didn't quite expect to feel that much in control. I mean, um, I said in my essay that uh, the question of consciousness. Well, the nat I feel like one of the things I've learned in the in, in, in the last year is that apparently the question of consciousness is very interesting to philosophers and of course writers who love to write novels about conscious about algorithm and, and robots and, and, and uh, machines gaining consciousness. 
but uh, in practical terms and to the people actually working on algorithms, on predictive algorithms, and it, it doesn't seem to be that important. And the reason for that is that actually when you work with it, um, you don't feel there's a conscious entity there. You do not have this, this feeling like you've entered the uncanny valley and something is on the verge of opening his, uh, its eyes. And, um, and uh, I don't know, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't have an answer to whether this is because this is all very early or whether actually the consciousness question is not that, actually not that important for uh, artificial intelligence. I, I, I really don't know, but the thing is, when you ask about did you lose control, you are somehow asking did you encounter some overwhelming but completely alien consciousness. And the thing is, I, I didn't and I don't think I was expected to. The interesting thing for me was it's really not about consciousness as much as writers and sometimes also philosophers like to think. That is a, um, a wonderful segue into another question that I had for a little later, but I'm going to read um, out a quote of your essay where, we, where you comment on that. Um, you actually comment on consciousness. Um, and I quote, and what is consciousness? There are many definitions. My favorite being an entity is conscious when there's something it is like to be that entity. I know what it is like to be me, to stand here, to speak. My existence has an inside. Um, the one to whom this insight is present in its colors and sounds, its whole rich whatness. That's me. So I'm going to ask a follow-up question. What was the first moment that you encountered or came to the conclusion that control didn't have an insight? Yeah, that's a question of intuition, of course. Um, and it, th this, is a, this is a very old question, but um, uh, when it comes to making a judgment about other entities having consciousness, uh, in some way we are always left with our intuition. The, the old theory, the old test idea, I mean, it's more an idea than a real test, uh, proposed by Alan Turing, the Turing test, is also about you talk to an entity, you, 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 you get answers and questions from an entity and, and um, if you are actually unable to uh, make a good judgment about whether that entity is a human being or not, then you have reason to suspect that entity is conscious. So in a way it always ends up with our, our, judge, uh, our intuition. And uh, I did have a few, that was one of the most interesting parts of this experiment for me was that I uh, could that, that I got the opportunity to question my, my intuitions, also to understand my intuitions better. And so, for example, one of the things I saw was that um, control can come up with very, uh, well, sometimes quite surprising and, and often quite to the point sentences, but what an algorithm, and I think per definition, a predictive algorithm never comes up with, at least in my experience so far, is a great metaphor. And, uh, and I think there's some reason for that because you do need, or at least that, that would be my, my working theory here, you do need actually, you do need a human life, a human body actually, and a real working consciousness to form a metaphor and uh, but then of course it's again uh, it's a question of intuition because um, when we look at some of the writing control comes up with then I so far always said yeah this is not a metaphor that convinces that would convince me of a conscious a con of a conscious entity being present but someone else could say, I have a different metaphor. <laughs> uh, sorry, I have a different intuition and, uh, and could come to a different judgment about that. I do think that in some way we, our, we do agree in our intuitions about uh, 
beings being conscious or not, the same way we would all pretty much agree intuitively that a dog is conscious and we would have a bit more of a disagreement with the question whether uh, an ant is conscious. But so I, I do think we can act, it, I, don't, I don't think it's completely subjective, but it's also not completely objective. It's not something that you can have a mathematical certainty about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, agreed. So Brian, often when we read about AI and conscious machines, our first instinct is to feel the sensation of dread, right? The fear of machine intelligence trespassing into human territory that will eventually diminish our cosmic significance. And I have the feeling that um, it's not so much about the fear of being replaced or losing your job to a machine. It's very much, or it's rather about the fear of discovering that we're not that special after all. And so at this stage, computers can drive cars, recognize faces, translate into different languages, write poetry and music, act as personal assistants, Feed the world champion in Go and Grandmasters in Chess. Just a couple of the most recent accomplishments. And those are all achievements that only 50 years ago, experts would have classified as signature abilities of human intelligence. So my question to you is, why do you think we struggle so much to attribute, attribute machines with human abilities? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we do continue to keep kind of pushing, pushing back uh, and saying, oh, if we get here, even with the Turing test, you know, people will claim that in some sense we've, we've beat the Turing test, you know, people have been fooled by simple algorithms before, um, or, or the goal is that, or control was designed to kind of feel like a tool. So I'm glad to hear that, uh, you know, it lives up to its name and that uh, you felt like you had good control over it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a really good question. Like why, why do we do that? Um, I mean, I think you hinted at it in the answer that we, we want to, I think in some sense, like we also kind of want to understand what we're doing as humans. And, and part of that is coming up with hypotheses, uh, and proposals of, well, this is what we're doing now. You know, maybe it's uh, science, or maybe it's art, or maybe it's just making meaning in general. Um, a lot of that is tied to language and communication, um, and in many ways, that feels very much like a, a sensitive area where we wouldn't want kind of algorithms invading too much. We wouldn't want that. We wouldn't want to lose that. Like the thing that allows us to communicate that that should be. I think feels special to us, but um, on 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 the other side, I mean, like other other animals have have languages that we're kind of discovering more and more. It seems there are lots of patterns out there more and more that uh, we're finding we've we've underestimated. I think the rest of the world um, and and many other consciousness consciousnesses um, that are out there. I don't think that necessarily means we've like reached something with AI or, or maybe that we ever will, but um, there is a, a pretty interesting kind of withdrawal sometimes, at least at first from these algorithms. It seems like it splits people into two groups, either one that's like, wow, that's amazing, or whoa, wait, should we be worried about this? And um, I think there are plenty of reasons to worry about it that are not us becoming not special, um, but it's more about, uh, you know, consequences of using these algorithms for certain kinds of things. Um, and, and making sure that like with control, which is kind of a statement in and of itself, like we recognize and understand that we are, we can make these things right now and, um, shape how we use them and kind of set, set the standards for like what we want to do with them. And it is our story to tell, like even AI is like part of our story that we get to tell, um, mm -hmm. As long as we feel that way, uh, I think uh, we won't feel too threatened by uh, loss of meaning or anything like that. We're still in control, right? <laughs> um, I thought it was really interesting that you both mentioned um, consciousness really is, is actually a human construct, right? We measure machines um, under this catalog of, of human abilities. And once they live up to these abilities or these benchmarks, then they'll um, 
you know, they'll they'll have the capacity for trespasses or whatever. But what if this is just complete, like artificially constructed and it's just a, a machine doesn't need to be conscious um, by our standards in order to um, be its own entity. It, I, as you can see, I'm struggling to find the words because there's no language yet to, um, to you know, de uh, determine or define this territory. But um, I thought, it's really interesting. We have these incredible machines that can play chess, and that has been a long time ago, right? We, they have beat us um, a while ago, and just like this is basically over for for like there's a human territory that we that we've lost so far, which is an incredible accomplishment. But we still have um, the more we talk about this algorithm, it goes hand in hand with the fascination, but at the same time, people saying, "Well, but honestly, these algorithms are so silly. Look at them." Um, when they produce a line that makes no sense, or they still can't, you know, recognize things that a four-year-old can recognize. So we have this this automatic reaction of, of dread, um, where we kind of almost feel that we need to make fun of where uh, where algorithms stand at this point in time. But perhaps we're thinking about this all wrong because perhaps it doesn't need consciousness to be its own thing. Am I making myself more or less? Yeah, can, can I? I'll follow up actually. Please. Um, this this uh, goes off to something Daniel was was mentioning before too. Um, over the last year, and I'm just I'm reading some of the questions from the audience. So I'm going to try to sneak some some thoughts in around like I've been, yeah I've been trying to think about this as well. Like like ever since we started this project in, and before and 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 so far the things that keep coming up are are these really nice metaphors of, of like Metropolis and this robot that Daniel mentioned, you know, being turned on by lightning, um, which just evokes these images of, in my head of like, you know, Zeus or Jupiter, like throwing lightning bolts and like us coming up with stories to explain things we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, I, I, I do wonder if this consciousness part has something to do with the lightning bolt experience of just a flash of something we don't understand turns something on in a way that we can't replicate with control with the chess algorithms with all of these algorithms we made so far i can turn them off and i can turn them on we did that you know for for today uh we turn control off we can turn it back on it's going to be the same um i can't do that with my dog or my cat i don't know how that works and it feels like there might be um some decoupling of concepts of what it means to be consciousness, which is really boiling down to something mysterious and magical we don't understand about life and experience versus like uh, something that um, we do understand it pretty well, uh, but might nonetheless contribute to dialogue and, and maybe participate in our linguistic community moving forward, like these algorithms do, right? When mm -hmm. as they complete our sentences, even in email and stuff, they are starting to participate, even if they're not conscious in that way. Um, yeah. I really like that. Um, I mean, science challenges constant challenges us constantly to rethink um, concepts that were basically set in stone. Just remind you of one, like this Cartesian dualism of body and mind that has existed over centuries. And then along comes a British philosopher who says that is basically a category mistake. It's these things are intertwined. They're not there's not this outside shell and this inside and they're decoupled. And furthermore, you have neuroscience is kind of proving that exactly that point. So the further we go, the more we um, distance ourselves from this, this thing that there must be some, some spark, some inside that fills this hollow shell, this notion of the ghost in the machine. And that's a beautiful metaphor because Daniel just raised the question of metaphors of how we explain why there's a unique spirit to every every person that um, in religious terms we call soul or animals or whatever. Um, so I wonder if um, really going back to our experiment and I've seen lots of questions in the chat function, did, first of all to Daniel, did you start to like question all these questions of um, or question marks of consciousness while working with control? I mean, this must be an underlying topic in your work anyways, but did it strengthen that? And are you curious to discover it and explore it further? You're muted. Yeah, sorry. I didn't, um, I didn't, I mean, the philosophy of mind has been a great interest of mine for a couple of years now. 
Um, actually working with control, as I said, it didn't actually raise, in, raise a lot of questions con uh, connected to the nature of consciousness, um, but it did raise a lot of interesting questions about writing and storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, because I realized uh, some of the things control can do well and some of the things control cannot do so well uh, actually teach you something about, about, uh, about storytelling, about writing. Um, because surprisingly, because you would think it comes from a computer, so it's very good about logic and consistency, but surprisingly, or maybe not when you look into how it works, um, uh, the, the, the machine is uh, very good uh, with, uh, is, is actually not that good about co consistency and is actually does randomness surprisingly well. So that it, it's quite inspiring and interesting and often quite funny when uh, Control throws something really unexpected into the the, the flow of, of, of sentences. Um, when, but it also makes you realize the the limits for the storytelling, for its, its its capacity of a tool for storytelling, have to do with its limits of consistency. Uh, it makes you realize that, for example, writing a story, you need more inner or hidden consistency than you would need for writing a scene or even for writing a poem. So um, the different genres also have different, um, uh, also differ from each other in regard to how they deal with consistency. And it made me understand that um, storytelling, uh, non-experimental traditional storytelling is actually the most consistent form of speech we, we, we have as, as, as human beings. And um, that's why you get to the limits very soon with control. Whereas um, dialogue can be very realistic if there is a low level of consistency because people uh, talk to each other in a quite random and inconsistent way uh, a lot during the day. Um, hopefully not on panels, but in their daily lives. So, uh, uh, so um, it, uh, text becomes more realistic uh, when you let the algorithm throw in some f uh, funny randomness. Uh, but in narrative prose, you always get to that uh, famous rule by Anton Chekhov about if there's a gun on the wall in the first act, then the gun needs to go off in the last act, which is of course not true. Uh, he means something that's true and we all understand it. What he really means is if there is a gun on the wall, you as the audience expect something to happen with that gun. So if the gun does not go off, it's also meaningful, but it is something that uh, the storyteller has to consider and has to do something with. And okay. that is kind of the limit of, of what a predictive language algorithm can do. Knowing that the audience expects something to happen with that gun and working with that expectation. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, um, may, may, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe, maybe Brian sees a way of how a predictive algorithm can also um, deal with this gun problem. <laughs> the, gun, um, the gun dilemma. Yeah, the, it's a different kind of gun problem than we, we, we usually talk gun about. Controls gun controls. Gun control, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's called the gun, gun control. control. I love that. But I think, um, I think for that you would need a different form of algorithm than an algorithm that predicts language patterns. But maybe I'm wrong about that. So Brian, as a, as a follow-up question here, why does control struggle so much with narrative consistency? What's the origin of that? Yeah, I think I think at the root of it, it's it's the same issue. It's it's similar issues to uh, what Daniel mentioned with metaphor, and I'll throw in also jokes. Seems to be pretty bad at jokes, um, sometimes in a hilarious way, which works out, but uh, it's often not good at telling good jokes. And and the reasons I think they're related they're a little bit different but with with something as long 
and far reaching in text that like involves this kind of compact plan. And then you write a book and the guns in the beginning and the guns at the end. Control can't see all of that at the same time. Um, like just to make a metaphor here, like control can see roughly, you know, a, a thousand words at a time as we're training it. So any sequence of text it sees it, 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 at one point, if it's like a training example for the algorithm, it only sees that. So if there is a gun mentioned at the beginning of a book and the gun mentioned at the end, it doesn't really know. It doesn't even ever see that those are really connected, except through some like very implicit way. But it could. So if you were, were to train it on instead of a thousand words on a hundred thousand words, could it create narrative consistency? Maybe, maybe. I, I think like the, the issue, the only hope if you want to be optimistic about these kinds of things is that uh, it really boils down to being kind of a, a, a data problem with algorithmic kind of advances that would allow us to process more data. So um, one barrier is, yes, you'd have to formulate a version of the algorithm that can see long spans of text and, and even has the opportunity to make such connections and pick up on the fact that every book people, someone right has written in the past uh, has a gun in the beginning and a gun at the end. It has to do something with the gun at the end. That seems like something intuitively an algorithm could pick up. The second barrier there is, well, compared to sequences of text of a thousand words, there aren't as many books. There are still plenty of books. There are plenty of things, but there aren't as many examples of instances of, of um, gun at the beginning, gun at the end has to do something with it as there is, you know, the word the, and then a word following the word the. There's just mm -hmm. more of that. And then the third, the third level there would be, just to squeeze this in, is um, having it be more embodied right now and have and have more of an experience of what it is to be that thing which what i mean is is instead of just having an algorithm that gets fed in text like that's nothing that's nothing like how we learn language or, or learn anything if you take that and you combine it with a system that you know has some visual understanding of some kind uh, auditory understanding maybe put it into a little wally and like put it into the world and, and after that, it's collecting its own data and it's doing all of these things that are kind of unique um, that would be hard to replicate for us ever again. Um, I think there's something there that we can get into around uh, at least a more convincing experience, one where maybe we would, um, so we would see it be a lot better at things. But mm -hmm. um, metaphors, for example, are, all, are gonna be hard for a long time Mm -hmm. To me, they seem to be like these these shortcuts in our heads of mm -hmm. of just like, oh, this and this, and they seem very disparate, but they actually fit. And and it's again metaphorically like control doesn't have that ability very often, like to see things that are very disparate, to have mm -hmm. an existence, to be out in the world. Um, but if you if you kind of kept pursuing that dream, um, then maybe maybe you could build something at least more convincing. Yeah, I like that. Pursuing that dream. Um, I mean, AI still is at, it, at its infancy, so there's, there's a long way ahead of us. So for now, it can create extremely surreal poetry and beautiful Beckett-like screenplays. Um, and I'm sure we'll get, we'll get to some um, Opdyke or something <laughs> not so long in the future. For now, I want to con um, continue to talk about originality, because at this stage, um, the word uh, there's there's like a like a term that is circulating at this point, which is mechanical creativity or artificial creativity, right? So these are um, two terms that not so long ago would have been impossible to fathom, but right now it has become um, a well well established concept. So my question to you, Brian, is if an algorithm is trained on the sum total of human literature, which, as you pointed out, is limited a limited resource it would still only reference what already exists. So how can it be truly creative? And when is this moment of, of an original spark happening? Yeah, great question. I think what's interesting about that question in particular is, is like Dan, Daniel has mentioned in previous conversations how, how repetitive and how, how often humans you know, can, can reuse things. 
that that other people have said all the time, right? Like exactly with something like like email, you know, that that's why predictive text can be so helpful there. Actually, when you're trying to tell a new story, it seems like, at least to me, it does still feel like some blending of a recombination of things that I've picked up. Maybe I don't understand quite how, um, and then a series of decisions that somehow decide which expectations I'm going to play with, which ones I'm not going to play with. And I think with um, algorithms like control, they're, it's, it's, a little, it's a little funny because the, if you look at the, the math of it and you look at the model, like we're learning a giant average in some sense over all of human, human text, which means it's not like any particular human. It's just, uh, it's the expectation of all of them. Um, so it's, it's actually kind of funny that where it succeeds in creating meaning with us, uh, I'm not gonna say it makes meaning, but like we might make meaning out of what it's generating is when it's surprising. Um, and I feel like that comes in, 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 two, in two different kinds of ways. One way is when maybe it's just wrong and and it and our internal model of what is expected is more accurate and we feel like control is wrong but we want to run with it anyways and then there's a, a setting which maybe it's right mm -hmm. and and we're wrong mm -hmm. and it's showing us actually what the expected thing is but then we still get to look at it and say whether we want to accept that norm or not mm -hmm. um and i i love that idea that's what i've really loved about kind of the short term of these things where I think it's allowing us to, you know, um, be more aware of kind of what the global expectations around language are, which kind of gives you like more insight into how you can make decisions and making your own meaning. Um, All right. I don't know. I don't know where moments of insight come so far. It seems like it comes from us when we see those things and like admit it into our story or admit it into our language and say, this is a valid piece of text. And now what does it mean? It still seems like there's a little bit of a gateway there for us where we, we have to let it in and decide. But through that process, it becomes ours, I think, more than it, than it is controls. That's how it feels to me, at least. I mean, it is interesting. I mean, the question of originality is out there because it's very hard even for us humans to define what is an original piece of art. And I wonder how Daniel feels about that. This is going to be the last question before I open the last round of questions. Then we go to the live demo and have a Q&A. So Daniel, you read and write um, for a living. So a ton of material. When is this? When do you experience this moment that you're actually um, reading an original piece of art, like an original thought? When does that happen? Sorry, you muted. Sorry. Yeah, it, it's very hard to give a good answer to that because it is an intuition when you... It, it's easiest, I think, with a metaphor. With a metaphor, uh, sometimes if, if a metaphor works really well, then you feel, wow, I've never seen it like that and I'm sure nobody else has. So, and, and also you, you know that a good metaphor seems so unlikely and unforeseeable that it's actually very unlikely that someone else ever had the same idea. Um, and, and, uh, and, 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 and that if someone finds it in, a, in an older book like 50 years ago, then you suspect that the second writer you, where you found it has actually consciously or not consciously stolen it. So uh, a very strong metaphor seems something that's so unique that it cannot be found or invented uh, twice um, that it seems just very unlikely and that's why also I think um, in, uh, a, a predictive language model ha has a very hard time coming up with metaphors because it's per definition about predicting the likely uh, outcome of, of, of a sentence you've started and a metaphor is about the most successful unlikely outcome of, of, of that sentence in a way. But there are very good writers who are not so strong in creating metaphors. So that's not the only 
uh, the only measure of uh, creating good literature is uh, metaphor is only one of many and there are writers who don't do metaphor so an algorithm that could, an algorithm could still create interesting literature but not create great metaphors so um, so another thing is of course if a story uh, if you feel a story is deeply meaningful um, because it's very much about those exact invented characters but also about your own life or people you know so it has to be a very unique um, a very unique uh, confluence of the invented individual and the non-invented typical so uh, and again you feel like that that's an Again, that's an intuition you have while you're reading or hearing a story that this is happening. And, um, and that is something I don't see why a predictive algorithm couldn't do that. That could actually work. But I think Brian men mentioned something very important. The question would be, could an algorithm do that only on the basis of having a lot of of having a basis of data of a lot of text uh, or would the algorithm need access to other means of information so could you know what would you actually know if you know all written literature but only written literature so i think actually and i know there's a debate about that among um, among ai experts and, and and brian mentioned that i think to some extent you need to embody that algorithm in some form, to give the algorithm some access to what it means to have lived experience and to be in the world. But then of course the next question is, would that algorithm be, need to be embodied in reality or could that algorithm just be embodied in a simulation, which maybe wouldn't mean to be embodied at all. I don't know. But so that that's where it becomes really confusing and, and, and interesting, but I think you need some you need access to some information that is not just written text yeah um i love that that's it's our imagination going wild at this point and um for a final round of question um and i know we could continue this conversation forever and perhaps have a third edition to this conversation because i feel like we're just scratching the surface still um the final round of question is dedicated to, to this um yeah, the open horizon. What is the future of literature? What is the future of literature and AI? Um, perhaps a couple of thoughts in this context. Well, first of all, there's this Roland Barthes um, famously attacked traditional liter literary criticism um, that focused too much on retracing the author's intention and original meaning in mind. And he said, it's the language that speaks, not the author. So eventually, I wonder if we're going to live in a world where we focus on on a text created by an AI, and we don't care that it's written by an AI um, because it's really about the literary excellence, so to speak. So that would be one way to look at it. And it famously, um, a couple of weeks back, Kay Alado McDowell published um, a book called Pharmaco AI. He, uh, they are the artist and machine intelligence program head at Google AI and got early access to um, the NLP algorithm from uh, GPT-3. And so, the book was, um, their book was reviewed by Elvia Wolf um, for The Atlantic. And she, she famously said that the result is surprisingly coherent and yes, it's beautiful. It's impressive not because GPT-3 writes like a human, it does and it doesn't, but because of how the collaborative process has produced a work that neither AI nor human could have written alone. So this seems to be like this we could really look at the horizon and see a, a glimpse into the future of this collaboration that could inspire um, the human to write differently. And so Daniel and Brian, you basically, you, you're part of this avant-garde now that is really pushing the envelope of, um, yeah, that's how are we gonna create literature in the future perhaps, right? So um, this avant-garde that predates historic shifts, like massive historic shifts in art, culture and society. You've already made history with this experiment and I'm really proud of you guys. And I wonder if we look into the future, for example, in Japan, um, an algorithm has already been accepted into literary competitions and has almost won. So 
I wonder um, if we're ready for this cultural shift, and if so, how do we, how do you envision it? Very open question for your final statement. Can I go first, Daniel? I can. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think we're we're seeing we're seeing the beginning of these things. Uh, I. In some sense, that's kind of, I mean, that was one of the motivations for this project as well, you know, to, to start seeing, I guess to go back to my opening story, when I, when I was working on the machine translation stuff and I built this machine and I looked inside and like, I didn't know where the meaning was. Um, and yet it seemed to be producing things. It was still, it still felt even more hollow. The, the, the moment in which it felt a little bit different with control was when it actually did start making me laugh regularly. And you know, it did inspire my colleague to start looking into poetry because um, it wrote a poem once that he actually did quite like, um, and that started to feel a little bit different. That like, it, no matter what's going on, if we just put aside all these questions of what, how it's doing it, and and why, it does seem like we're we are we are getting better at building something that. Uh, understands language in the way that like sensors understand electromagnetic waves or we can detect other kind of natural phenomenon. There's this thing language that we do. There are tools that we're building to be able to get insight into it beyond our own personal insights and our own personal lived experiences. And now we can use those things to then filter back, like propagate back into language itself and, and literature itself. So if literature is in many ways about playing with our own expectations and our own models and conveying our own sense of, of life and experience and, and, and just uh, exploring that range of possibilities. Like when I read a story, it's often, it's very uh, fulfilling to say, to see how the, the space of possible lives and, and, and ways of saying things is done by another person that I would never have done. Um, and I, it does seem like, in some sense, the algorithms will be able to contribute to that as other data points for us. Um, now those go back into us and we'll create new algorithms and, and, and we'll have this process of continual like learning both ways, I think. Um, but it will be very interesting to see um, where, where we go from there, where when, once, once those things actually stop feeling mystical and meaningful and we get used to it and then we and then we really start asking and we're already asking it but really have to start asking like what what are we gonna what do we do next um what do we do with these things well the eternal question of the human spirit what is next um i mean we've already gotten very used to siri and it's kind of a baffling invention <laughs> if you think about it so daniel what's your take on the future of literature in the eye final statement Oh, I don't, there, there, there's no final statement there. Famous final words for this discussion. <laughs> but um, I think, um, I think the interesting question is really about algorithms as a possible tool for storytellers, for, for human writers. Um, even, I mean, even as a thought experiment, if we can imagine a long, and very good novel or film with film i think it might be a bit more realistic entirely written by an algorithm i would claim we would still not be eager to read it because there is this aspect of literature or art as one human being speaking to other human beings so if we take consciousness and human humanity out of the equation completely, we would actually, even if it's a good book, we would not be extremely curious or curious only in a superficial way. Um, but of course, what's more realistic also and also more interesting is the question of algorithms as a tool. So uh, as uh, uh, writing or other art where uh, there there is some kind of product that's been produced collaboratively, collaboratively by a human mind 
and a non-human mind. And um, I mean, in very practical terms, I could imagine, for example, even more than a language algorithm, I could ima imagine some kind of plot algorithm be really helpful. The same way lyricists use, uh, use rhyme dictionaries without at all feeling that they are doing something um, that takes away from their creativity. So the idea that I would write a story where, I don't know, where a few people uh, jump into a car and go to, I don't know, to uh, some strange place and then I run out of ideas and then I can ask the algorithm, so give me something really interesting that could happen to these guys. And then the algorithm comes up with something really unexpected. And then I actually write it in my own language. That would be wonderful. And I don't see, again, that might not be doable fully in a predictive language model, but that would be something extremely useful in practical terms and something where I don't see why it should not happen. Yes, I think this is what we're all aiming for. Um, NLP algorithms as a tool to inspire writers to, um, you know, reach different uh, different depths and heights in their literary work. And to illustrate this, we're very, very excited to give you, dear audience, a live demo of Control in Action. So, um, and after that, We'll follow up with a Q&A session and I have a gazillion questions in the chat function that I'll ask to Daniel and Brian. Um, so Daniel, take it away. All right, I'll go to screen sharing and uh, I'll, I'll, call up, um, I'll call up the algorithm. And um, this is control. And so I will, I will type in, uh, a sentence that actually um, a writer friend suggested to me because he said he would be curious what control would do with I opened the garage and there was a dragon so here it is and I hit the control key and just a moment I'll do it again When we tried it out before, it also took control a moment to... Um, all right, this is because it's a live demo. So I'm we'll hitting... Check it on my side. Keep them entertained, Daniel. <laughs> I'm... I'm uh... I'm hitting the control key. There's not much I can do. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try again. I opened the garage and there was a dragon. So, and now I'm hitting control. Uh, this is embarrassing. It worked before you guys saw it. <laughs> yeah, that's why we had the text. Oh, no, here, 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 here we go. Here it is. Here it is. Sorry. There's some delay. Now, because I, I hit control a few times, it comes up with the... So, it had been in my mind to put it on display at our house, but we decided that it would better for it, uh, better for... Ah, yeah, yeah. So, and this is just repetition. Uh, better for, and now it's on me to go on better for him to leave him out there and give him food. So that's my contribution. So now let's see. And there is, that must be because Zoom is, is running because I've never had that kind of delay. Um, so so you saw control answer. So you saw I'm not making it up, but I keep hitting control. It must be because of Zoom. Um, I think we, have, yeah. we just have to wait. Maybe, oh, what about we answer a few questions while yeah, we're waiting? I was waiting about to say, in the meantime, maybe. perhaps we can <laughs> yeah. go on. It's a bit faster on, on mine too. You could, uh, you could tell me what you want to write if, I, if you want me to pull up my screen. Oh yeah, let's, let's, let's try that. <laughs> Let's try that. So I'll end, I'll end screen sharing for the moment. So yeah, let's, let's try it on your screen. Okay, here I am. 
Okay, decided that it would be better for, yeah, let's, let's go with for him to leave out, uh, for him uh, to leave him out there and give him food. Like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Period? All right. Let's see. Ah. <laughs> So that's good. The dragon is very friendly with us. He will come close enough for us to pet him. So uh, this is nice. This seems to be a nice dragon. So what about he also talks in his sleep? Um, I don't understand his language. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> this is such a nice story. Um, so let's make it a little bit less nice. Let's write, we had three cats. Oh, wow. <laughs> but the third one got eaten by him. It was, period. It was an unfortunate accident. Per no, let's see. Wow. <laughs> This is, yeah, you see, this is one of the moments when, when, when you have to decide, is this, um, is this too inconsistent or is this actually a stroke of genius? It, 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 it's hard to say. Um, so you can see how much work went into, let's say, raising him, went into raising him. Uh, let's go on. He's like a child, except oh. he eats cats. Oh, oh, here. Now, no, no, that's good. Now, let's, let's go with this. Now this dragon has become part of our family. No, this Aww. is good. My wife and I were so excited about having a new pet. Okay, let's say uh, this one was much better than the third cat anyway. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. I wonder if it's going to realize there's another cat. <laughs> Here's another picture of the dragon taken from inside the garage. And, oh. and, and, and this is, for example, is really surprising because he re, it control remembers the garage from the first line. So control does actually remember things, even though it's very hard to say how it does that uh, on, 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 on the basis of just predicting language patterns. But it did kind of remember that it was meaningful that we mentioned a garage uh, in, 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 in the first uh, line. So um, here's another picture. Yeah. Um, um, uh, so let's say now all we need to do is find a way to teach him English. I just assume it's a male dragon. I don't know why I made that made an assumption, but let's just go with it. If you want to know more about dragons, or you know. there you go, there you go. Okay, that's that, so. I think that's a nice uh, that's a nice way to end the, the demo. But that was in a very that was a kind of a sweet story, I think. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to to kind of go into one of the questions that I saw in the chat too, and and your comment about like garage, and this and this question of length. So. Uh, I haven't counted these number, this, these words, but within this window, essentially every time it generates a word, it can look at everything going back about mm -hmm. 500 words. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's almost like for something like garage, it doesn't even need to memorize it. It just needs to go, it can go back and look. Mm -hmm. But then once you get into a much longer form text, if we went maybe two or three times as long, then and then you, and you mentioned this in your essay, uh, it might struggle to hold on to those details even more. It, it, would, it would start to lose track of that even more because it, then it can't see it and it doesn't have that a memory system like, you're, you're, like you uh, suggested it probably needs. Um, yeah, but so it that's mean, an interesting that means, one. But that means when it generates sentences, it's kind of, by your programming, it's biased towards repeating words that already came up in the text, right? So it has a 
kind of an incentive or a bias to to mm -hmm. use garage or dragon or house again because we had those words right correct for sure for yeah. sure mm -hmm. for sure yeah and there's actually like a, there's a good um balance in here uh of like the way that the algorithm is trained and i think uh things that we've noticed is like as you are training the algorithm a lot of times more recent words are more likely to show up next um, this can be true if we're talking about, you know, Daniel Kelman. And mm -hmm. now we're talking about Daniel Kelman, and I'm going to say Daniel Kelman a lot, um, because in this conversation, you know, I'm talking with and about Daniel Kelman. Um, so that is like a feature of language that the algorithm picks up on. And there's actually something in control that we did to basically try to fight that instinct a little bit, or like that natural um, pattern in the data. So we do have some things that try to. Um, uh combat that a bit and like reduce the dependency but someone else in the questions mentioned like why does it stutter sometimes mm -hmm. and sometimes that's going to be when uh when we essentially haven't tuned that well um for that kind of uh scenario where like if i if we turned that off completely it, it might just start repeating words um earlier on and if we leave it on then at some point uh, you'll see sometimes it will say like a whole page of text and then just start over and complete and completely say that page again, which is uh, mm -hmm. which is actually something we don't fully understand either yet. I haven't seen like a good analysis of why that happens um, just from an algorithmic standpoint. All um, right, actually. gentlemen, um, I need to interrupt you here because we need to segue into the Q&A section because we have really a long list of fantastic questions that I want to go through. So my ask to you is try to keep the answer as brief as possible so we can go through all of them. And I also invite Ross Benjamin back on stage because there's a couple of questions for you too. I'm going to start off with a with a fun one. Uh, one question was, Daniel, you call control your lockdown companion in your essay. Do you miss control now that the experiment is over? Oh, that's an easy <laughs> answer. Uh, uh... Oh, am I am I muted? No, I'm not. No, I don't because I'm still I still have control with me. So uh, it's still like 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 tonight, by the way. So uh, no, control is still part of my life. That's excellent, um, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a an interesting follow up story on that. Brian, um, how do or did you negotiate and address human bias regarding race, gender, for example, in your algorithm programming? Yeah, great question. Um, so we we did try to filter filter some things out data wise. Um, we we spent quite a bit of time going through the resources and trying to make sure that there were um, like parts of the internet that we didn't want inside control inside its head. Um, and then there are also a few things in the demo in particular where like it it won't say certain things um, because I have some some rules uh, behind the scenes that will stop it. Um, um, so that's the extent of it, but that is very related to those implications and consequences I was referring to earlier in the conversation about like, even the short term, you know, there are decisions we have to make about actually using these, these kinds of systems, especially as they get stronger and, and see more. All right. So there's a decision tree that basically prevents you from, um, this spinning out of control and, and creating another tie incident. Like the Microsoft yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, fingers crossed, but that's why, uh, that's why just Daniel and I get to play with control too. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Ross, this one's for you. This is on algorithmic translation. How would you translate something that control writes? How do you translate the voice of an AI? Hmm. Yeah, I didn't really have to hear because, because uh, Daniel's using English in the, so I don't have experience doing that. Um, I mean, I, I don't suppose I would really translate it that differently from how I translate what, say, a non-living writer writes or somebody I can't speak to or I can't, I have no access to the meaning behind the, the language um, other than my own intuition. So I'd probably just try to translate the surface of the language. Um, um, and uh, Translating a voice does not only mean translating consistency, but you could also translate incongruity and senselessness. So, uh, you know, to keep it short, that's that's what I would probably do. 
All right. Um, I like that answer. There's um, there's a question from a fellow fiction writer here who says, hello, fellow fiction writer here. Um, fiction writers often speak of their characters taking over in writing stories, choosing their actions over the will of the writer crafting them. Do characters then have some consciousness, some greater role in meaning um, making in meaning making than AI in creating meaning then? That's for Daniel. In case it wasn't clear. I had the sorry my my audio was was a bit weird. Can you say again? Sorry. Do characters so it, basically tell, talking about um, that characters take take over <laughs> take over the the will of the author. Do characters then have some consciousness, some greater role in creating meaning than um, the AI? No, I I wouldn't say I wouldn't go that far to say the characters have consciousness. I think. Uh, that thing characters taking over it is still a metaphor it is still not something that really happens it is something you feel or something also you that people like to imagine when you come up with unexpected solutions but uh, those people you invent they are still a function of your of the writer's consciousness they don't have one of their own <laughs> I'm very relieved to hear that even though I would like that um, Brian uh, did your ideas uh, about literature change in the course of this experiment? What was your biggest takeaway from the interaction with Control and Daniel? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think I thought a lot more about literature, so they did change. Um, um, I think my biggest takeaway was that um, we have a lot to do on the algorithmic side uh, and uh, but even so, there is um, something something fun and delightful about uh, this 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 kind of collaboration that I hope to see. You know, I'd love to see stuff like this just repeated and and tried out frequently as the algorithms get better and it just becomes a normal thing that that everybody is doing all the time. Um, so it actually increased my optimism about all of that. I went in optimistic and I came out even more optimistic. So, but. Maybe one other small thought was that like uh, uh, working with, you know, Daniel and Clara and Martin is, uh, is uh, by far still more fun than working with control. So uh, <laughs> yeah. lots more to do. Until you discover that we're all AIs, yeah. but that's for another day. Um, another question for Daniel. I love this one. This is really nice. Um, in your essay, there's some, uh, there seems to be a certain tension between ideas about magic. One of the quotes would be like a genie, in a bottle and technology when describing or thinking about control. Could you elaborate on this, this tension of magic and, and technology? Uh, well, there's this line which I'm quoting from Arthur C. Clarke that any sufficiently advanced technology feels indistinguishable from magic. And um, I mean, that's just true, anthropologically true. Uh, we can see that, for example, the Marvel movies, which is very, where, where, interestingly, they do not distinguish between people like Tony Stark, who have awesome technology, and people like Wanda, who is a magician. So for pop culture, it's the same. And of course, it's not the same. I'm not going to say it's the same. But the truth is that when you deal with very advanced technology, you're kind of expecting a magical effect and sometimes you feel an effect that you call magical. Like for example, when I first realized that the control doesn't know the rules of English grammar and spelling and still doesn't make any mistakes. And of course there's not magical that can be explained, but it feels magical. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's what it feels like. But I'm not going to say it is magic. It is still, um, it is still, there's still a very good explanation for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Edison was called a magician. Um, so that makes perfect sense. Brian, the question for you, are there meta works um, that are easier for the algorithm to work with? Are there ones that make it harder? I'm quoting easier and harder in quotes. Meta, meta words, interesting. Very easier for them to work with rather than ones to make it harder. Um, I think, um, well, I don't know about the meta words part, but there are definitely words that are harder and words that are easier. 
so for example, control hasn't seen very much medical text right now. Uh, so uh, we actually did try to like adapt it to some medical scenarios and and that requires more data. You know, that's like a hard thing to to do just with an algorithm that's trained on things from the broader public's uh, writing. Um, so maybe like newer words, obviously, you know, to and even a greater extent, like control hasn't seen very much of non-English, so other languages. Anything that's um, a little rarer, I would say, anything that is gonna have fewer like instances of it appearing in, in kind of this broad corpus of communication would be harder. Easier things are, I guess, the opposite. All right, then I'm gonna wrap up with this final question. Um, all of them were absolutely excellent. So keep them coming for future events um, on artificial intelligence. So this one is addressed to the three of you because I'm just really curious to hear all of your opinions. Um, following up on new forms of collaborative interaction, artistic collaborative interaction that produce a new form of literature. Uh, which can either be done by a human or a machine, which can neither be done by a human or a machine alone. So this is really about um, the synergy. I still wonder um, whom the human author collaborates with in the end, with the machine, the algorithm, or rather ultimately with Ryan who wrote the program. So um, it's basically a question about the ghost in the machine. <laughs> who's in charge, who's in control? No, I'm not in control, quite the opposite. I think that's an extremely good question. Um, and there are different answers possible and they're all correct, I think. And maybe Brian has a different uh, take on it. I think, yes. I think if, if Brian does, you could say, actually, if Brian does his job well, which he did, then the algorithm is actually an entity in itself and you're collaborating with the algorithm and not with Brian anymore. You could, of course, also, it's actually ultimately a question about causality. You could say, because Brian created the algorithm, it is, it is in collaboration with, with, with Brian. Uh, and then you could also say, because the algorithm draws on this large, gigantic pool of data, uh, which is literature, cre or what, not literature, like text, lots of text created by human beings, you could in some way also say it's a collaboration with that, um, with the totality of all human beings who wrote this immense body of text. Uh, so, which is a thought I really like. So that, that, that's, a, that, that's a way I like to think about it also. That's so beautiful to write about, right? With this incredible heritage of human creativity. I'm gonna segue to Ross and then finish up with Brian. Ross, what's your take on this? The future of literature. Uh, it sounds almost like a, I'm Jewish, but it sounds like a Christian theological <laughs> question about the transubstantiation or co <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, 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 the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and are they the same or some kind of higher unity? Or, um, but um, uh, 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 from my own experience, to keep it uh, uh, grounded, in a way, because I started my translation career in the digital age, but before algorithmic artificial intelligence really took over, as far as I understand it, as before sort of like neural net networks and that sort of stuff, because because I remember earlier translation machines, earlier machine translation being pretty useless, and now it's not useless. Um, uh, but because I started in the digital age, I was always, um, I always had access to this wider collaboration that Daniel's talking about in a certain way, um, that before you had to go to the library to have access to it, you know, and, and it was so much more selective, you couldn't, uh, you know, use a search engine to, to just um, find, you um, uh, selections of usages of different phrases or, or as the Google Books library grew over the, 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 the decade since I've been translating, uh, more than a decade, um, I'm trying to seem younger than I am, um, but uh, over the time I've been translating, um, as the Google Books library grew and became more refined, what you could search, um, I was always sort of sifting through this, uh, these discourse networks to see language in different contexts and try to, you know, do things that you couldn't do with just the, 
say German to English dictionary or just an English dictionary and a German dictionary, or even with the translation dictionaries, many of which I still use online just to get a, a set of a, a, a sort of starting set of synonyms. Um, and then when machine translation became algorithmic, whenever that was, I didn't, you know, I wasn't on the cutting edge of these things. So I don't think I really knew until suddenly I noticed that there were, I think Google Translate got much better, but then I, there were also these new, like there was one called Deep L that I really like um, for German translation. Um, that's really amazing. And, and it is in particular, like you mentioned with something like emails, um, you know, spot on. And then with something like literature, it still amazes me that there are things that I learned as a translator over many years, sort of little tricks and how to, um, uh, how certain kinds of German syntax could elegantly be transformed into English syntax by, you know, using some different sets of English rules that are different than the German rules, but can, are good, very compatible and so on. And that it took me a long time to develop those tricks and strategies that now, uh, that now a uh, uh, machine translation picks up on and is able to do. And I'm like, oh, that's a, you know, maybe I didn't think of it. And I put it into the machine translator as a tool. And I said, oh, I could use that kind of, it used, it used that kind of sentence. It wasn't necessarily a great translation altogether, but it figured out actually formally the kind of sentence I could now use here that didn't occur to me even though it's a strategy I may know. It didn't, so it's, it really has become a, a much more useful tool over the years and does have some of that sense of, uh, of, uh, of amazement and of the marvelous that we associate with magic where, where it's like, how did it, you know, manage to sort of pick up on, on that, um, um, especially when I don't understand what's you mm -hmm. know, under the hood. Uh, I'll stop there. Wow, that's, that's a really nice answer. I like the fact that you really pointed towards the fact that it made your, your, um, your job easier in many ways and not because you're translating things through Google Translate, but rather yeah, it inspired you to think differently about uh, your craft. Really nice. So Brian, you wanna wrap this up? Who's in control? <laughs> yeah, we're in control. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're telling the story. And uh, you know, as you can see with Ross and translation, just historically speaking with the neural networks and everything that's been going on, like machine translation is, been ahead in some sense of language models of the kind that we worked with Daniel. Yeah, so it's it's kind of not surprising that uh, translators who've been using machine translation and, uh, for, for a while have, have kind of engaged with some of these things before. And and it it's in this context of translation um, and Daniel's is in the context of just freeform writing where there doesn't seem like there's a, a grounding for the text. Um, but they're but they're similar, and I think we'll just continue to develop these tools, and hopefully they 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 just enable our creative processes to be different and new and easier and more fulfilling and satisfying for us. Um, and uh, you know, and and like Daniel was saying, and and Ross, like the, these things are built off of off of all of us, you know, as a community. Uh, it's a lot of translators have have poured in hours and hours and hours into the things that uh, you know, machine translation systems have been trained on. All of us have spent a lot of time typing things into the internet as a global community and control is trained on that. Um, and, uh, and, and Dan, Dan was right, like in some sense, uh, the more independent uh, th th these algorithms become, the more I feel like I've succeeded and uh, I don't know what that means for my collaborative role in all of this. Uh, maybe it's really my job that's that's uh, my collaborative role that's most threatened uh, in this scenario. If I succeed, I I immediately make myself obsolete, right? Um, whereas that probably isn't true for the writer or the translator and the artist and the creator. Um, but uh, you know, it's I'll be proud of it. You know, it's like having a kid or something. Uh, you let it go into the world; it becomes independent, and then. You just say, all right, well, I played a role in that, you know, but, uh, but it doesn't need me anymore. And uh, that's my goal. So. I love the fact, remember when all of our parents told us you shouldn't become an artist, <laughs> right? And now we'll, we'll have birthed a new generation where everyone is encouraged to become an artist. That's the only job is not going to be obsolete. I like that future. It's a beautiful one. All right, and with that, I welcome Martin and Juliane, Sarah and Kylie back to the stage so you can wrap this up and give a final uh, round of applause to our three panelists. Thank you, Daniel Kielman. Thank you, Brian McCann. And thank you, Russ Benjamin, for joining today's conversation about Kielman in 
control. Juliana, you want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Clara. And thank you, Dania, Russ, and Brian, for this very rich and uh, energetic um, conversation. And I wanted to, to end with a thought that, that I got at the end of uh, Daniel's wonderful essay when he quotes um, control as um, with a poem that uh, we all secretly suspect Brian wrote, but perhaps he didn't. And, and I thought it was a wonderful way of, of ending the essay. And if you haven't read the essay, please get the, the, the German original and eventually hopefully also Russ's wonderful English translation to, to read it. Um, and, and what that poem made me think of is that, that in a way it, reminded me of, of the interaction between Oedipus and the Sphinx, which is of course a very mythological story. And uh, you will all recall that, that riddle that, that Oedipus had to, had to solve. And I thought it was a wonderful way that to, to end the essay about thinking about the future by pointing back into the past to complicate the whole argument, to basically reverse back to the future into forward into the past and leave us with this quixotic sort of uh, openness. So uh, thanks for that riddle, Brian. Thanks for quoting that riddle, uh, Dania. Thanks for translating it wonderfully with the uh, iambic uh, uh, meter, Ross. And uh, so we, we all have lots of more things to think about thanks to your collaboration. Thanks to Open Austria initiating this whole uh, AI storytelling project. Thanks to Daniel's essay, the translation, the publishing, and as Brian indicated, it's it's a communal effort now and in the past. And uh, perhaps before we say goodbye for good, Martin, do you want to add to that? Do you want to say anything, or do you want to stay being the wizard behind the screen? No, I, I think this was a, a very, very, very moving uh, conversation uh, between um, uh, human beings and uh, the absent and not absent uh, control algorithm. And I just wanted to say uh, that um, as we uh, initially felt uh, and created this uh, project, uh, this is uh, something that we didn't dare to uh, hope for, which was, uh, you know, we, we brought uh, uh, a writer uh, like Daniel Kinman of the Statue of Daniel Kinman together with um, uh, Brian and then uh, also, you know, this uh, mysterious algorithm uh, control. And we didn't really know what was going to happen. And I think uh, so many things have happened, uh, elements of stories, reflections uh, on the stories, reflections on what AI can do, reflections on what human creativity is. Uh, so that was a, a very, very gratifying experience. So I wanted to thank uh, everybody uh, who is here at the moment on the stage uh, present uh, for this uh, collaboration. Uh, and I wanted to thank uh, again, of course, um, uh, everybody uh, here for coming, making this event possible and uh, looking forward to many, many more uh, collaborations in the future. Thank you so much, Martin. Wir machen das bald wieder. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a nice afternoon. It's about to uh, be really thundering here any second. So uh, before we all uh, get uh, switched off, bye bye. <laughs>